But yeah, uh, looks like people are signing on now. Um, right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Acucolor webinar series uh, live on Zoom. Uh, today we have a special treat, uh, Andrew Cavanaugh, or Digital Art Drew. Uh, today is going to be creating uh, digital art with Photoshop. Uh, we're going to take Q&A, just send in your questions um, in chat, and uh, Andrew will answer them as we go along. If you have anything left over, we can um, send uh, questions over during the Q&A at the end. Um, but uh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like somebody in chat asked if they can hear me. Uh, Andrew, you can hear me, correct? You sound fine, yeah. And I think my volume is good. All right, well, I'll be on chat here. Um, Andrew, take it away, and we'll go from here. So just kind of do my thing, and then you'll read out any questions as I go? Yeah, for sure. Great, okay. I'm just close chat. Uh, should I introduce myself? Yeah, take it away, Andrew. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am uh, Andrew Kavanaugh. As Ali said, I'm a digital artist. I also do Photoshop and Lightroom tutoring. I do photo editing, photo compositing, retouching. And I run a few groups on Facebook, Photoshop and Lightroom group, AI art and digital art group, Strange and Surreal, and help out with the Photoshop and photography group. So I see there's a couple of things in the chat, but I'm just going to jump on it. So as you can see in the background, I have the uh, Adobe Firefly beta. I'm not sure how many people have played with that, but it's pretty cool uh, AI. So you can do things like text to image, generative fill, text effects. And then I'm also going to show uh, ways that you can create some of that AI in Photoshop using the Photoshop beta. And so uh, let me just show a little bit of Firefly and then I'll show you uh, how to get to the Photoshop beta. So let's see. Yeah. Not sure if you can see it with the panel, but I move that out of the way. Um, so if you go to firefly.adobe.com, that is how you can access it. It used to be invite only, but it's now open to the public. So if you are in the home page, you will see, like I said, the text to image, generative fill, text effects options. You just scroll down a little bit and you can see other things that are coming in the future. And then if you want to go to a particular area, like text to image, you just hit the generate. And then the first thing you'll see is a gallery. So it's a gallery of the different creative images made with the text to image prompts. And then if there's any particular image you like, you can hover over it. It gives you the basic prompt. So here, so island at the middle of the ocean with extremely luxurious glass, et cetera. And then if you hit try prompt, it'll generate the image from that prompt and then you can tweak it a little bit. But uh, I wanna go here down in the middle, bottom middle area. And I'm going to grab a prompt that I have. It's a bit wordy, just paste it in. And then I hit generate. And then once it does a generate, there's not a real kind of preview icon you just notice that the squares kind of fluctuate and then you get some pretty nice results. So from the get-go, when I click on it, you get a bigger view. And then when I click the arrow, you cycle through. You see the different uh, beautiful, very colorful images. And then uh, the thing to know is when you click on it, you can, let me just move this panel out of the way here. When you go to the top, you can favorite it and that kind of keeps it in your library. You can download it. And then the three dots, when you go there, you can submit to the Firefly Gallery so others can see it or copy to clipboard. And uh, so I'm just gonna cycle through kind of like this one. Yeah, some will get a little abstract, but they're quite nice, quite cool. This one's really nice. So I might favorite this one as well as go back and then just hit the download button. And then I can bring that into Photoshop to add elements. Um, now, as I said, I'm going to be using Photoshop, the Photoshop beta. And with that, you have more features for AI. And I will show you them today. So the way that you would access that is go to your Adobe Creative Cloud. So once I click that in the top right of my desktop, the app pops up. This is set to the 
home view. And I'm just going to move this away. And then if I go to apps, it shows, if I click on all apps, it'll list all the apps that I have installed. What I always tend to do is I go to updates and then I click the top right, check for updates. That's the best way to make sure you are about to install the most recent version of any app, be it the regular or the beta apps. And as you can see, my Photoshop beta is already installed, but what I will do or what you would do if you are new to it is as you go under categories on the left, at the second from the bottom is beta apps. So the minute you click on beta apps, there's a list of the different beta versions, Illustrator, Premiere Pro, and in my case, Photoshop beta is already installed. So it just says open, but if it's new for you, Photoshop beta would be listed and you would just click the install button. So I'm going to click out and then I'm going to go down to my Photoshop beta. And you can see the uh, one of the images, one of the photos I have open, correct, Ollie? Uh, I can't hear him, so I'm just going to- Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was okay. muted. Yes, I got okay. you. So yeah, I just have a series of images, but um, so what I would tend to do is I'm in the Photoshop beta. I just do command O to open, go to my desktop. And uh, where is that image that I just downloaded? So date modified. Okay. I did just download it. Right? <laughs> so I'm going to go back. I don't know why I don't see it on my desktop. So just click and I click download and hit continue. Hopefully it's not going to a uh, download folder. But I also have an app called Trickster. So when I go there, I can just go to the top image, go to the cog, and I can say open with. And with open with, I will choose the Photoshop beta. So there it is. And I'm hitting the F key. So you see a, a full view of the image. And I have my navigator panel open. I'm just going to bring that down a little bit. And the one thing you'll notice is if I go up to image, image size, that the default is 1024 by 1024. So if you want it to be larger for say Instagram, you would have to go to your image size panel like I am now and make that 1080 by 1080. As you can see, the default for my resample is set to preserve details. Most of the time when you're going larger people, tend to go to preserve details, enlargement, or if they're going smaller, by cubic sharper reduction. When you're going larger, I suggest that you choose preserve details 2.0, which also uses some of that Adobe Sensei or AI to repopulate the pixels in a more integrated way. So I do that and it's slightly larger. And then with this image, I hit F key to kind of bring it out. I don't want it too large. And then I have a series of images that I have already open. So the way I like to work is I'll grab an image, like here's a color image. And uh, let me just move these. So as you can see in the layers panel over there, it's just a background. All I do is grab the background layer, holding the shift key, I drag it into that image. Of course, it's a larger image, so it takes over. And what I tend to do is I will right click on that layer, convert it to a smart object. Um, I think for most part, if you were to transform any layer and resize it downwards, you wouldn't notice any real kind of lack of quality or loss of quality, but I do like to convert it to a smart object to preserve as much as possible. So I do command T as a bounding box. I then do command zero and I can see the bounding box and the little tabs I can use to pull in to reduce. So I guess that would be control zero on a PC. I hold the option key and as I pull in, I can resize from both sides. And then I'm just trying to see how this might fit. And then I'll go to the edge where you see the double arrows. And I just turn it a little bit to kind of move with the composition. 
hit enter and return. And then there's two ways that I tend to work with images. Let me move my navigator panel over. That should be good. Uh, two ways that I'll work with images. First, I want to go to that layer and rasterize source is I will cycle through the layer blending modes and see what kind of creative combination it makes with the layer underneath. And if that's not clear enough or it's too abstract, then what I will do is with that layer, I will select the subject or remove the background and just kind of play with blending that way. So first thing is I'm in that top layer. I just hold my shift. You have to be in the move tool. And then I hold my shift key, press it down and just hit the plus key and it cycles through. And so you get various creative, that's kind of cool. So you get various kind of creative effects with the way it blends. And so if you're like in the, as an example, the darker color mode, and let me go over here. So there's like the darken, multiply, darker color. That's where like the darker elements will stay of that image and the lighter areas will be kind of knocked out. And then as you go further, so you will see that there is like the lighten, where you see lighten screen, lighter color. That's where the lighter elements of the image remain and the darker parts are knocked out. And so I tend to just cycle through. I'm looking for just what kind of has a nice effect. That's kind of nice, a bit green, but I like the way it blends. It's a little dark but I'll cycle through until I find something that kind of works with the background image. So I'm gonna go back to that green. Yeah, this one. So that's hard light. And then using my space bar, I move my image over. I'm in that layer one. I just go down and I add a layer mask and you'll see layer mask that's built in is that white square and with a frame around it. So the frame is telling you that it's active. I just click here to switch to black, or you can hit the X key to toggle black and white. So black will erase and white will bring back. So I have black as my foreground color. I just choose my brush and I'm using my right bracket to make it larger. And then what I tend to do is I go up to my options bar. So opacity is set to 100, flow is set to 100, but that's too high. So I'll just, navigate over to the word flow where it'll bring up a, um, I forgot the name of it, but the, the little uh, hand that has the two arrows. So I can just click and then pull to get to the number I want, which is much faster. So maybe like around 30, 30 flow for strength. And then I just kind of paint away elements. So I'm painting to bring back the background elements while being attentive to the elements I like of the topmost layer. So I'm trying to blend the two. I want that there. And I jump around. So I will jump back to the flow and make that a bit stronger for different areas that I want to kind of bring it through. I don't want anything that shows the original like square edge of the image. So I'm very kind of attentive about that. And I do like to just kind of keep um, painting at it. I don't like to go too high with the flow and then just kind of knock out an area. I like to kind of paint my way around it and clean up because there might be areas that I might enjoy remaining. So I kind of like that and just bring some of that through. And then I tend to turn on and off the eye icon so that, You'll see that gives you a, a preview before and after. So I'm just seeing what the image looks like behind to see if there's any little details that I might want to bring through my image. And so do that. And then I go up to flow again, and I'm going to bring that down, make more subtle. And I think I want to blend some of those little elements. So yeah, it's going to make it so it's, really floating looks like it's between the two worlds I like that a little bit of the hand let's go down get the top yeah and then yeah the one thing i don't like is the top area that you can see this sharp kind of straight line so 
the flow of 23. I just keep painting until I'm blending that in. So it looks a bit more organic. Yep. So if we zoom out already, I like that. So it's a mixture of the Adobe Firefly image and a stock image I got from Pexels. So before and after and just playing with the, and what I tend to do is when I'm working on something, I'll obviously always save the PSD, the layered file. And what I tend to like to do is instead of like layer one, I will type the name, click, type the name of the layer blending mode I used. So hard light and uh, turn. And don't forget to save. So I'm going to save it into my today folder. Um, but it's keeping the prompts as the name. So I don't want that to be, I'll just call it um, Deep Ocean. And I do tend to keep it the uh, color profile of sRGB, as I will be sharing this most likely on my social, like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and even YouTube, the community tab. So but I always save the PSD. And then I will go back and flatten like a, and make it a JPEG or PNG. Um, so in this case, I kind of like the image that it's created with the combination of the two, but just for the sake of showing options, one thing I'll do is first I might go in and clean up areas. So I tend to like this spot healing brush. And then once again, I use the right bracket, make it larger, and I just go over that area. And so if you are going over an area and it's not doing anything, make sure you click on the other layer. I thought it might be on the top layer, but it's in the background layer. So I'm just doing that. And I'll just kind of inspect the image and I'll just kind of take out areas that I think are distracting, just little, little specks of light or color that I don't think necessarily need to be in certain areas. Kind of weird shapes. Oh. <laughs> clean that up. So I'll go around spotting a little bit, cleaning up. And these kind of bubble areas don't bother me. That kind of integrates the two images together nicely. And then once again, I'll inspect again. So I notice that the image is covering up the jellyfish on the left. So I go back into the layer mask. Click on that. You see the white frame around it. Make sure I'm in a brush. And I just click on, click off to see where it was. And then I can just paint with black being foreground color to kind of clean up that area so it's not hovering over it. Save that a bit. And so some of the new features I wanted to show you in the Photoshop beta. So the first thing you'll notice is you have this contextual taskbar. And if you don't see that, then you would always go to your window menu. And that's where you can find, uh, where is it? Yeah, there it is at the bottom, contextual taskbar. So if it, you're in Photoshop beta and it looks like this and you don't see it floating, just go up to window, contextual taskbar. And so what that does is it's trying to make your life easier. And so some of the things that we'll do is you'll notice that when I'm in the layer mask over here on the right, it will default to options related to that. So it's saying, do you want to subtract from mask, add to mask? And as you hover your cursor, you'll see that it's saying modify mask, hide mask, and then you can change the mask view. And then the one thing that I tend to have to do is a lot of times when you open an image, it appears over the image. I tend to have to grab the contextual taskbar, move it down, and then with the three dots here, I will then choose pin bar position. So once you do that, when you open up any new image, it won't hover above it. Okay, so with this contextual taskbar, if I choose a my lasso tool in the toolbar and say I just make a little, a loose selection, so I make a loose selection in the top left, as you can see here. And then you'll notice that the contextual taskbar changes to say generative fill. So once I click on that, it says, what would you like to generate? So I could just say 
colorful jellyfish. And then you just click the generate button on the right to generate variations. So when you click that, you see a progress bar. Pretty quick, 15, 20 seconds on the average. And it's pretty cool. I mean, it looks like it could have been from the original image. And then most likely your properties panel will pop up. If not, once again, you would go to window and look for properties. But once you have properties panel up, it reminds you what the prompt was that you used, the text prompt, colorful jellyfish. And then you get variations. So you get a series of three. And so if I look at this one and I'm like, I like it, but this has nice color. If I click on it, then you get the preview of that or click on that one. And I think I like that one. I think that kind of matches the color scheme of the original Adobe Firefly composition that was created. Hey, Drew, that, that question. Sure. Uh, how do you remove the Adobe brand down there where it says Adobe Firefly in beta? Okay, so one rule, <laughs> one rule is when you are in Adobe Firefly and you generate your image through that website, Adobe Firefly is not for commercial use right now. So when you go to use that for the first time, that site, you will see a warning that says you agree. Do you agree to this? And so you are agreeing to not use it for commercial use. So knowing that I'm just going to share this with um, you know, Facebook or Twitter, I'm fine with using the image. So you can't use these images for commercial use, such as creating a larger version to print or for a client. So the idea of trying to get rid of that watermark is not something that um, you should be thinking about. Is that good? <laughs> okay, so... So behave, everybody, not for commercial use right now, but soon enough, they Adobe is obviously very aware that a lot of people want to use it for commercial use. So they're taking that in, into account and they're making a lot of updates. And when they feel that it's stable enough and they can also implement like a higher resolution, they will make it um, for commercial use. Okay, so one thing I also wanted to show you was, so you have colorful jellyfish. And so that is, over here in the layers panel, you'll notice it now has a new icon. So that's for a generative layer. So you have the icon for the generative layer, and then you also have another built-in layer mask. So just like any other layer, you can turn the eye on or off. So you get the preview. And a couple of things I wanted to show was you do have, because you have a built-in layer mask, you could go in and paint with black to erase certain parts of it. And then if I go back to my properties panel, you'll notice that if you are selected in the layer mask, it defaults to layer mask properties such as density feather. So make sure that you click back on the regular section of the generative layer on the left. So when you go back to your properties, you're back to colorful jellyfish and the variations. So another thing that's great about this is once you're in this properties panel, you can say, okay, I like this one, just the one selected. And then if I hit this little generate button here, what that will do is a little progress bar, and then it'll generate another series of three. So here we have slightly different, maybe a little bit more um, definition or detail, and a little bit of a different color sequence, similar. So this is very similar to this one, but I think I might even like this one more. So that's quite nice. And then one thing to be aware of, and let me just zoom in a little bit. So I zoom in about 130%. If you are in that generative layer and you're like, oh, I like this, this image, this jellyfish, but I'd like to see it over on the right side. The minute you click on it and move it, you'll be like, oops. You'll notice that it has this kind of background. So it, it it's not a clear, solid, knocked out element. It, it brings parts of the background that's integrated with the image behind it. So the better way to do that is if you 
wanted to move it, an easy way to do it is I hold down my option key, alt on a PC. I'm in the move tool. I just click and I drag it over to that area. So I know that that's now the top layer. I turn off the original one and then I go back to the properties panel and it still has this layer selected, but it's a new one. And I hit generate. And what that will do is it'll create a slightly different jellyfish, but it'll automatically clean up the background for me. It's pretty fast though. That's Oh, that's pretty cool. So it's different, but I kind of like it. It's a little bright. Um, but we have this one and we have this one. I think I like this one. So I keep that one. And then, of course, I can go back and turn on the other one. Now, as I said, the once I've moved this and I've generated it with the properties panel, it does have that built-in layer mask. So if I click on the layer mask, choose my brush, and I'm going to bring the flow down to like 12. With black as the foreground color, I can paint subtly and make it kind of more see-through, more translucent. So just kind of playing with it to kind of blend it with the composition. Yeah, so something like that. I'm just going to save it. Okay, any uh, questions, Ali? Uh, nothing yet. Okay. So that's, you know, having fun with starting with Adobe Firefly, moving into Photoshop beta and using the generative fill options. Now, one thing I'd like to show you that's a lot of fun too, is if I were to just do a simple command N for new, and uh, I'll, might as well just choose, well, maybe I'll do something larger. So 2048 by 2048, 300. Um, let's see. What's like a theme? I'll just say, uh, I'll just say underwater cave. So say underwater cave. And then uh, it's a little bright. So I'm going to uh, just fill with black. <laughs> Zoom out a little bit. And I'm going to grab another prompt. So if I'm in a, a new image, it's just new blank image you'll see that the contextual menu just defaults to import image. It's very limited. But the minute I do a command A or control A on a PC, you'll see the marching ants. It's a selection around the whole image. Once I do that, you then now have the generative fill option. So if I click on generative fill and I type in underwater cave with flora and fauna, et cetera, and then hit generate, you can create similar to Adobe Firefly, the Adobe Firefly aspects in Photoshop beta. So this one's pretty abstract, but I can see this one if I click here. And so that's pretty cool. So that creates this kind of underwater cave with flora and fauna made of organic shimmering dust particles and spirals. That's nice, right? So I like these blue ones. And so you could do that and then the same type of options apply where I can go to the lasso tool. I can select here, go down to my contextual taskbar and where it says generative fill. I just type in, and this time I'm just going to type in jellyfish. I'm not even sure I need to type in colorful and I hit generate. Theme 20 seconds, pretty quick. Okay, so by doing that, it kept the kind of color theme. So it's trying to match, you know, and you'll even see if you look in the preview in the properties panel, it keeps like the background elements, which is great. So it keeps like those kind of rocks and the, you know, algae and whatnot. Um, but I'm curious. So if I go back and I do type in, um, I don't know, purple jellyfish and then hit generate. Should give me a series of three, but this time focusing on purple. Yeah. That's creative. I like that. Kind of goes with the, you know, strange details of the rest. And then 
to make this a bit more fun, I might uh, move this over and then do a large section with the lasso tool. Go to generate fill and type in, uh, I don't know, tropical fish. I don't know. Maybe there's a particular fish that would be better, but. Got a question, Drew. Okay. Uh, Laura is asking, are That's the Photoshop bad. generative fill images usable for commercial purposes? Right. So same with, um, if you go to Photoshop beta, nothing kind of pops up and lets you know that it has the same kind of criteria rule as Adobe Firefly. But yes, Photoshop beta is also kind of an agreement you make for not using it for commercial use yet. But by the very fact that this is in Photoshop beta is that they're working on this to release it into the regular version of Photoshop someday. So all this is pretty new, just a few months old. And so these are pretty creative. I like this one, second one. And so in time, the, they will be able to be used for commercial use. So the way I think of it is, you know, you might get a little frustrated with that, but just think of it as this is your practice time. So with Photoshop beta and Adobe Firefly, I would just go in and try as many different aspects you can with it. Try different prompts, try the different tools that come with it, you know, get comfortable with the contextual taskbar, which now is in the latest version of Photoshop itself, but I don't believe it has generative fill. It just has the access to the contextual taskbar, but get as comfortable with it as possible. So then when it does get released in the regular version of Photoshop and other apps, then you can be comfortable to use it for commercial use. Another way that it is being used is and I can show you that as well, is in Adobe Express. So Adobe Express does have Adobe Firefly elements uh, built in. So here you see that I, just by typing in tropical fish in the uh, generative fill area, and then just hit generate, it created this. And then if I, let's see, if I wanted to be a bit more particular, I could say um, blue, and green, tropical fish, hit generate again. So instead of like blue and kind of yellow, let's see what happens when I type in blue and green itself. So it's even a, a totally different type of tropical fish, which is nice. This, I kind of like that one. And it's kind of coming from the side in, so it has a nice sense of depth. That's beautiful, though. I like that. So I'm just going to save that. Any uh, questions? Uh, nothing current. Right. Okay. So just to kind of show some aspects for creating, uh, you know, digital art or compositing. I have a series of images open, and I go to. So say I have this swimmer here. Um, you know, there's two ways that I'll try to bring in an image like that. So first is I will just make a tighter kind of selection with the marquee tool. Um, and I might right click and then choose feathers. So the edges will be feathered. So instead of three, maybe I'll make it like a six. And then instead of doing a command J just to make a new layer from the selection, I will hold down the option key to title it. And I'll just call it, you know, like swimmer. And then if I then drag that over to this image, once again, I right click, I convert to smart objects. So it retains quality, command T to transform, command zero to zoom out. So I can see the boundary box option, drag the point to get both sides. When I move my cursor to, let me zoom in a little bit. I move my cursor to the edge. What will happen is it'll go from a regular cursor to a double arrow. And then I can just tilt the kind of movement of that image. And I'm still in the bounding box for transform. So all I do is hold down option, click to make it a little bit smaller. I'm trying to see how it might fit. So I hit enter return. 
go to that layer, right click, and I like to rasterize it just to keep the file size down. And then what I will do is make sure I'm in the move tool at the top. You can hit V or just hit the move tool. And then shift plus will cycle through the layer blending modes again. That's pretty cool, except it's the front part of her, her face is missing. Yeah, this looks like it's maybe too busy behind. And so it's obliterating the way it affects the top layer with the layer below. So when that happens, I'll zoom in a bit. And then you'll see that in the contextual taskbar at the bottom, you have two options. So first is what I'll try is I'll just click on remove background. Um, I've been noticing this, this recently, this is kind of a, maybe a bug. It's supposed to select all the elements behind her shape and knock it out. But it, if you see the layer mask, it's as if it's just knocking out I don't know, background beyond the square, like the square has not been affected. So I'll do a command Z a few times, go back to that layer, and then I'll do select subject. Yeah, and even that's a little strange. So the select subject is selecting the whole square and not the image, maybe because it's um, lacking a sense of contrast. So when that happens, I will just go down to the fourth tool down, and uh, go to quick selection where I can just click and drag. It's a little strong, but as I click and drag, it's grabbing more elements of the background around her figure. Around her legs, her feet. And then I go back with the option holding the option key, alt on a PC, hit the left bracket a couple of times, make it smaller. I just kind of paint over her to, so that takes away from the mask. Now, if I hit the Q for quick mask, that'll show you a preview of what's selected. So the background is what I'm trying to select. It's overtaken her image. And so I need to go back and clean that up. And I've heard people say that the quick mask mode is like, old school, but I think it's it's still relevant and it's a nice way of working. So just hit Q again, I get back. So holding option key while in the quick selection, yep, quick selection tool. That's how I will deselect her from the background. So option key and just kind of keep drawing. And I might hit the left bracket to make my brush smaller. So it's a little bit more sensitive and not kind of bleeding out. There we go. Got a little bit of the background there, but so yeah, it's pretty good in certain areas. And try to get her hand. It's not too bad. Yeah. Okay. So then what I'll do is I'll zoom in using my space bar to move over. I'll use the uh... so it it defaults to the plus sign, which means it adds to it. So I can just click and pull to grab the background. So I'm trying to grab the background elements and wherever I want her to be deselected, I hold the option key, click. And then, so I'm gonna add a little bit more underneath her hand. So I just click that area. Around here. And then I tend to, even though it's old school, as they say, <laughs> I like quick mask. So I'll hit Q and that'll give me this kind of Ruby lith preview. And then all you do is you choose a brush and you want your flow. So up in the options bar, you want your flow to be 100. And then you want a smaller brush. So I hit the left bracket. And then when I paint with black as my foreground color, I'm adding to that background selection. And if I go over her leg, like I did here, all I do is hit the X key. And as white as my foreground color, I will paint away. Now, if you notice that I'm painting some of the areas like a little fuzzy or soft, you can just right click and then change the hardness of your brush. 
So I feel like it's too soft. I can bring it over to more like 90%. And then when I'm selecting, it's more like a sharp edge. So X to get white to clean up around her calf area. X to go back to black. And then I can paint the background. And I'm not going to get too crazy so we can go over other things today, but just kind of clean up left bracket and make a smaller brush, clean up the background, add to it. And a little bit around the foot there and there. And it looks pretty good. The Q again, zoom out a little bit. And then I will tend to choose, if you choose any of these selection tools up top, such as the marquee or the lasso tool. So just as an example, I choose a marquee. Then when you hover over your image and you right click, you can then choose feather. So in this case, I might choose like a, a two. So the way that the feather radius works is the lower the number, the sharper the edges of your subject. So if it's a very realistic composition, it might be like one. For this, where I want it to be a little softer because she's down, you know, deep sea diving in the ocean, I might make it two or three. If you have an image like a sun image or a moon image, and you're bringing that over into a composition, and you want that to have like what is a uh, suggested glow around it, then you might make it like 12 or 14. So just two is good for this. And then if I click on the add layer mask here at the bottom. Now, if I'm selected to just the background, it'll do the opposite. And you'll see in the preview that it did that and knocked her out. So what I can do is right from here, I can even click inverse. So there's that icon right in the contextual taskbar. And then right there, I can say create mask from selection. And then it knocks it out and it kind of blends better with the background. Obviously there's a little bit of edge, but that's very easy. So you just choose your brush and right bracket to make it larger. Flow is already set to 100. So that's uh, best strength. Now, one thing that I've learned is uh, helpful. So what I'm going to do is two things. Right click to get back, and I'm going to make my hardness zero. I, I like a soft brush. In this case, I'm just cleaning up the edge. But a trick is a lot of people think that once they're cleaning up this extra area in the layer mask, they need to kind of follow the line down. And But the, the trick is you just click the top. And if you hold down your shift key and click the bottom area, it follows that straight line. So click. And then let me move the contextual taskbar. So click on the right side, click on the bottom left, boom, click, and then click the top. And there might be some extra areas you might have to go in and clean up. But for most part, it's very quick by doing this shift click way. Yep. Okay. And so now she's much cleaner. And I'm not being perfect because, you know, time, but, you know, that general feel. And then if I'm working on this composition and I feel like I like the feel of it, but she's a little washed out, uh, there's two ways that I would work on the image. First is I make sure I'm in the image, not the layer mask. So I click the left. So there's a frame around it. I'm also going to just do a command S to save so I don't lose all the work I've done. And two ways I like to do, say, tonal correction is one is if you're directly in Photoshop, you can just do Command M on a Mac or Control M on a PC. Up comes the curves panel. I can bring that over because I'm just focusing on her. And of course, first you have presets. So you could just say increase contrast. And you'll see that it creates that kind of typical S curve where the, the dark parts have been pulled down. So here's your darks. Here's your darks, here's your midtones, here's your highlights. So a lot of times just, you know, going to that, that's what I'm looking for is fine. But if I don't like what they've done, you can click on the points, pull them up to get rid of them. Or if you hold down the option key on a Mac, alt on a PC, watch what happens to the cancel button. It turns to a reset button. So reset. So if I just do that, so when you hit reset, that means that you don't have to leave the whole curves panel, but you're taken out of that last function you used. And so I can go to another preset if I wanted to, like strong contrast. 
but that's even stronger. So I don't want that option reset or knowing how the image feels. I can just go and say, okay, I want to tweak the midtones a bit. So I go to the midtones and I pull down a little bit. Do I want to make the, the darkest areas even darker? Maybe a bit. So she blends with the black or dark areas in the background. And then I go up to the kind of highlight areas and pull that up for kind of a little punch in the highlights, especially around the uh, leg thigh area. Hit OK. And so if I go to the history panel, you can see that I can go to here's before, here's after. But I am going to go before again, just so I can show you. Uh, that's my actions hide. <laughs> I wanted to show you another way that I like to work. Um, now, in general, if you wanted to go back and forth, you could duplicate this layer, make it a smart object, and then go into what I'm going to show you now, camera raw. Um, now, Ali, I see that this says number four in chat. Are there any questions first before I jump in? Uh, yeah, Drew, uh, comment and a question. Uh, one from Julie. Uh, love your uh, workflow, Andrew. I usually have to pause and rewind and watch the tutorials, but I'm able to follow everything. Nice work. Uh, your voice was a little uh, grumbled there. Um, can you say that again, please? Uh, from uh, a comment from Julie, uh, she Better. said, I love your workflow, Andrew. I usually Thank have you. to pause and rewind when watching tutorials, but I'm able to follow everything. Nice work. Excellent. Cool. And then uh, a question from Dale um, says, uh, Andrew, do you imagine that one day the contextual tool toolbar maybe repl uh, replace many of the tools in the Photoshop toolbar? Right, so that's a great, great question. Uh, and that's from Dell? Yeah, correct, that's from uh, Dell. Does it have his last name? Yeah, Cruz. Oh, okay, I wasn't sure if it's, there's a Dell Vincent in my group too, but uh, yeah, great question. So as you can see, if I'm here in the top layer and I click on the regular part of the layer, it says select subject, remove background. Then as you hover, um, it's not giving me the, sometimes it gives you the description what it is. And this I know is adjustment layer and then here's where you can pin it. And then here is just um, some properties. So it takes you to like the properties panel, which is nice. Now, if I go and I click on the layer mask on the right side, the minute I click on that, you see the frame around it. It now says subtract from mask, add to mask. And then it has some more kind of options for the layer mask itself. And then of course, properties again. I would imagine that, yeah, even when you start off with, say, a fresh document and you choose a particular tool, the contextual taskbar might come up with the most used options that you use for that tool. So, yeah, that's a great question. I do. I agree. I think that in the future, it might even be wider and it might have like a set of the most used options for any particular tool or you know, layer mask or a particular thing that you're working on. Okay. So I'm just going to jump back. I'm on my image again, not the layer mask. And I wanted to show besides just going to uh, the, uh, not layers, but the uh, mask is going to filter, camera raw filter. And then for curves this way, you know, you can go when you're in the basic panel in camera raw, you can just tweak like exposure here. And then you can also play with contrast. So the one thing, the reason why I wanted to show this was, yes, you can just do curves very easily, just command M or control M. But when you go to camera raw, you have so many different options like built into the basic panel. And so it's nice to be able to tweak the exposure, the contrast, and then are the highlights too bright? If the highlights are too bright, I just move them to the left to kind of bring density back. Shadows, do I want to open the shadows or make them darker? Same with the blacks, do I want to make them a little bit darker or open them? And then whites, I usually move a little bit to the right for a little bit of a highlight punch. So that's kind of, you kind of a, a push and pull that I tend to do with these sliders where I'll move the highlights back to bring back information, but yet I will move the whites or the brightest brights to the right for a punch. But the good thing is I'm still in this panel. I can then go to say texture or I can move that to the right to sharpen it a little bit. Um, clarity is a little kind of hard hitting for me. So I tend to 
do te texture or go down to detail and do sharpening. Dehaze, so if your image, you know, maybe around the uh, this area of her feet, if I go to dehaze, I'm, yeah, if I move that to the right, it gets a lot more kind of realistic or dense. If I go to the left, then the whole thing kind of gets obliterated. But uh, that's good for little touch-ups of foggy areas and kind of, you know, overly lit areas. And then I have the vibrance and saturation sliders. I'm not a fan of saturation. I just find that the minute you do this, it, it saturates everything. And like, I'm only up about 30. Yeah, if I could take it down to even 20, 22, she's already very yellow. It's so, you know, overcompensated. So I find saturation to be too kind of neon-y, too hard hitting. And one thing that's uh, nice to know when you're working in the sliders and camera raw is if you if you move it too far to one way and you want to instead of sliding it back, you can just double click the tab and it goes back to zero. So I much prefer vibrance. So vibrance, if I move that to the right, will bring color to the areas that are slightly muted or lacking saturation, but it's not oversaturating everything. And then I'll hit OK. And now I feel like that image of the woman matches the background much better. Now, one thing um, to let you know, uh, for me, uh, one of the first things I did to get comfortable with Photoshop, and I think it's just a very helpful way of looking at it, is to understand that you might have different options for the same thing. And one thing that's important to know about Camera Raw is it's great. It has so many options right there built into one section and the next. You don't have to go anywhere. It's all there contained in one. But if you go back to filter, you'll see that it says camera, it says not 3D <laughs> filter. It says camera raw filter. But then you also see it says camera raw filter down here. So the one thing to be aware of is if you choose filter and you choose the top one camera raw filter, that will apply the exact same settings that you just added to your image or, you know, layer. Whereas if you go down to filter and choose camera raw down here, then you go back into camera raw fresh and you'll see over here exposure set to zero contrast highlights all set to zero so that's one thing that's good to know because people will tend to think that this is a quick way to get to camera raw but it's just reapplying the last settings okay okay i see that there's q a should i click on that ali or do you have you want to read it to me yeah uh here's a question uh from mike uh, can you show what the metadata would say that indicates that uh, AI was used? Uh, we have a photo club contest and we are saying AI beta can't be used in our contest. Right. Um, I can't remember it offhand, but there is like a um, an Adobe website even. I think it's interact connected with Adobe where you can bring up any image and it can let you know where that was created. I don't have it offhand. Um, I can get that back to you. So I can give that to Ali and he can share it with um, with the attendees. But there is a site where you can upload any image and see what the source is. So if I work on an image like this and then I upload it to that site, it might say created with Photoshop beta. And then it might even tell you that it has generative layer, um, generative layer layers, which are generative fill or basically AI elements. So that is a great tool to do that. You might even be able to search for that. Adobe, I don't know what the terminology would be, but it would be like Adobe AI image verification or something. And that might take you to the correct site. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. Mike said, thank you for the info. He's going to look forward to the email. I'll send it to you, Mike. Great. Okay. So yeah. And then... Um, so I just wanted to show, you know, kind of the ease of working. So this is, you know, working with some of the AI elements, working with some stock images using layer masks. And then if I go to some of the other open images I have, just wanted to show how easy it is. So here's, here's an image, just, you know, stock image. I love this image. So, and then if I just simply go command J, I make a new layer, turn off the background layer. So I'll be able to see what I'm doing. Already, you'll see that the contextual taskbar says, select subject or remove background. 
So if I click remove background, it does a great job at knocking out the background. So if I click the plus icon at the bottom, new empty layer, drag it underneath, and I don't know, if option, delete, fill that with black, you'll see that it's pretty good. You know, there's certain kind of edges that are a little, you know, little nicks, but as you can see, it has the built-in layer mask. So I could just click on the layer mask, choose my brush, and then go in and clean up little edges. And once again, if it's too soft, right click, move hardness up to like 90. And then when I go and I clean the edge, it kind of matches, matches the original. So maybe that's too edgy, clean that up, you know. And once again, you can click and then hold that shift and it kind of does like a straight line. But I think some of these kind of variations of the wrinkles are look fine. Um, so that's, you know, one aspect. So if I just go back to my history, back to new layer, uh, let's see, just layer via copy, zoom out a little bit. You also see the contextual taskbar also has select subject. So right there, I just one click and boom, it selects subject. If I hit the Q key for quick mask, I get that nice preview. If I zoom in, command plus a couple of times, space bar to get the hand. When I go to this edge, I'm in my brush already. The opacity and flow is set to 100 the way I want. And then all I do is paint and I can add to that selection. I might zoom in a little bit more, left bracket for smaller brush and I just do a little bit of the leg here so I'm just adding little aspects you know depending on time I might get really detailed about it other times I might say it's good enough but if I zoom in I might notice that you know in this leg area there's an overlap left bracket make it smaller x for white to be foreground color and then I can just paint away that left bracket to make it even smaller so I can get in there better and just clean that up and then I see more. That's the thing with Photoshop. The more, <laughs> the more you zoom in, the more you're like, I need to fix this. Now I need to fix that. Now I need to fix this. <laughs> it's like retouching. When I do retouching, it's skin retouching. I can work on it for hours. Okay. So command zero, I get back. And then I just hit Q again. And then if I wanted to, I can hover. I'm already in the marquee tool. Hover over the middle, right click choose feather. And like I said, in case of this, where it's more realistic, I can just say one. And then if I click on the contextual taskbar mask, it'll add that mask for me. So I don't even have to go over. I don't even have to reach over to the layers panel and click on add layer mask. Pretty nice. So then, so here's the cool thing. Now that we have all these new AI aspects, generative fill, I can be in this image and I can say, um, let's, let's have some fun. So I do a command A. And if you zoom in, you can see the, the marching ants, the selection. And so the contextual taskbar says generative fill. So I could just say colorful spiraling universe. And then I hit generate. Maybe I, and I probably misspelled a bit, but it's, I don't think it matters. I think it obviously knows where it looks like a Grateful Dead t shirt. <laughs> so maybe I'll get rid of the word color, colorful, and uh, see if this is spelled. No, I think it's spelled correctly. And I'll just hit generate again, getting rid of the word colorful just to see if it's more realistic. Um, a little progress bar. Maybe spiraling is too much. Maybe just universe, hit generate. And as you can see, you can just keep changing the text prompt in the properties panel, hit generate, and you can keep going. So you can just keep going. So that might be even more appropriate now. There we go. So let's see. So I bring her back. So that's now in the top layer. I just click on layer one where she was, drag it to the top. It's pretty cute, right? And then uh, 
go back to the generative layer. So yeah, be aware that if I'm in the top layer again, I go to properties, then it's like saying, okay, what do you want to do? Transform that layer, remove background. I'm like, well, what happened to the options for generative layer? So you got to be on the generative layer. Then when you go back, you see your different variations and then you can change that. So let's see, universe with moon. It generate. Since she works for NASA, you know, I have to. It's a bit, a bit simplified. So you might have to tweak the prompt, add some more elements. Um, I see the chat. Yeah. So as Rick said in the chat, um, when you create with, say, Adobe Firefly um, and you download the image, you will have the name, the, the file name of the Firefly doc will have part of the prompt as the title. So that's one way that's really helpful to um, remember your prompts and then to be able to go back and copy your prompts. So you do have to get a bit creative with the prompts. So a lot of people think that with AI, it's all very simple and that you just put in a few words and it does. but no, you do have to spend some time. So you might have to say universe with moon, let's see, and stars and then hit generate. And then, you know, if that's not good enough, then you say like with uh, floating planets, I don't know, you know, and you just keep adding elements to it. Yeah. So that's kind of more fun. I, I like that one. Some of the stars are a little abstract, you know, <laughs> but it's creative. And then I might just, you know, go in and then save that. So girl, moon just say it yep um so let me see what other images we have here uh not that uh this one hmm. i like the kind of creativity of this one but so there might be like an image that inspires me and then you know, I might make it a, a full layer above and then select all. And then let's see. Blue. Let's see. Deep. I don't know if deep ocean will work, but, you know, you think of some prompt that might work. It generate and that's going to generate a new background for me to integrate this. And then I can also show. I think we're, we're past the hour, but I can show some of my, uh, oh, this is nice. Okay, so that is nice. I like that. And I do believe that in generative fill in Photoshop, it will reach out to its kind of library and it will reference Adobe stock images. So it's either kind of generating an AI image altogether or it's reaching out to its Adobe stock library as reference. So I just go to layer one, move that to the top hit F. So we're just focused on this image. And then I can go after selecting the move tool, shift plus, and then I can kind of cycle through. So that's pretty cool too, where I can have like an opposite where, because it's set to lighten, the lightest areas kind of pop out and the darker areas get knocked out. And I usually like to look for something that has a, a blend of both but there's some pretty cool effects just by zooming through the layer blending modes. That's just with the move tool selected shift plus. And I find that a lot more kind of inspiring when I'm creating than to just add a layer mask and kind of blend out areas because it might kind of one layer blending option might give me another idea for the composition itself. And then when I'm working on it, if I see something I like, but it just seems too dark as an idea, I might um, just open up my curves, Command M on a Mac, Control M on a PC, and then I might just kind of lighten it. So I'm going to the midtones, pulling up, and I go to the highlights area and kind of pull that up even more. But it's mainly in the midtones, just so it doesn't seem kind of overly dark, heavy, and it's the kind of blending naturally. So just just by changing layer blending mode, do I get the uh, possibility of blending? And then I will tend to, you know, now 
I'm surprised it doesn't have like the option to add the um, layer mask right here in the contextual test bar, but can't be too lazy, right? So I just go to the bottom of the layers panel, click on the layer mask, choose my brush. And then I can't even see it because it's smaller. So remember the right bracket. Now you can either do right bracket to make it smaller, left bracket makes it, or right bracket to make it larger, left bracket makes it smaller. Or once again, if you right click, you bring up the whole brushes panel where not only can you change the size, you can change the hardness and even the style of brush. So you have all the different kind of general brushes. You can have like wet media brushes, dry media. So you have a lot of options just by right clicking. And I always tell people, especially when they're in Lightroom, to make right clicking your best friend because you always get so many options right at your fingertips and it just makes the whole workflow much easier. So, so even here at 70, it's a little small. And then I might click out and just say whatever and hit the right bracket. And then I jump bigger. Yep. So then I have that. And then I just kind of see before and after. Obviously, I don't want the flow to be 100. So I go up to flow. And then you get the scrubby slider, the hand where I can then pull, bring it down to, I don't know, like 15. And then when I paint with black, oops, it looks like it still set to hardness. Yeah. So I'll see that it is hard edge. So I'll do a command Z a couple of times, right click, bring that hardness back to zero. And then now when I click, it's much more subtle and painterly in blending nicely the way I want. And I might even move that lower. So instead of flow of 15, I might make it a nine or something. And then I just paint through. And then I like to see before and after, what are some elements that might look nice to let come through? Do I need this dark area of the shoulder? Not so much. So I might kind of blend that more. There's like a line around the edge. I don't need that at all. And then I just kind of blend those elements. Okay, and then I think we're beyond time, but I just wanted to show a couple of different things that I like to do with an image, you know, like this one, creating um, a little bit of a shout out. Let me move these uh, panels. This is the BenQ panel, <laughs> or not the BenQ panel, it's the Zoom panel. Um, move that over. And then I now have access to my infinite color panel. So the way this works is, so I can be in this layer and the layer is set to multiply. So it might even be a little bit more unpredictable results, but all I, all I simply do is I click on it, open it. And then I go to intensity. I move that halfway to the right. Kind of jumps. And then you just hit the create button. And then when you do the create button, it gives you variations of kind of color grading. And so this is a really a nice way that if you've worked on a composition, a creative composition, as opposed to ultraly uh, realistic, you can just keep hitting the create button and it gives you different color variations, which can kind of change the whole dynamic of your image. And some are like a little bit more hazy and some have a better contrast and uh, an understanding of the tonal range. Some keep similar to the original color. And if it, does, if it is keeping too similar to the original color, then I realize, you know, it might be better with a, a direct image, not something I've already played with the layer blending modes. And I might delete it. Then I go to my image and then I go back up to filter. And remember, not the top camera raw, but the one that's listed down here. And then it shows me that image. And I can start off by, instead of basic, I collapse that. I go down to color grading. And the way I like to work color grading is I can go, it shows you all midtones, shadows, and highlights, but I also like working larger. So I can just say, okay, I really want to work on the highlights and the darks. So if I start off with the shadows or the darks, I can say, I want them to be kind of like a bluish purple. So if I go to the edge of this color circle, it's showing you that the saturation is a hundred. And I can just move that down. So it could be a little bit more purple, which I like. And if it was too strong, I can do two things. I can either click on the circle. And as I click, there's a line that you see. I can just go towards the center. As I go towards the center, the saturation goes down, as you can see in the slider. Or if I'm at 100, of course, you can just click on the tab in the saturation 
section and move that slider. But I like it kind of solid. So I'm just going to click over here under my color grading adjust area to highlights. Click highlights. And then for that, I might give it kind of a greenish blue. Obviously, that's too strong. And I tend to like to click on the circle and move it inwards. I know you can go down to the slider, but I'm already here. So I just click. And as I pull, there's just a touch of the greenish blue. And then when I hit OK and go back. Yeah, in this case, since it's set to multiply, you don't really see the effects so much. Let me go back. to So that's normal. And then I might go back to the move tool and do a shift plus and cycle through and see if that kind of has a better one. Due to the nature of the image, it, it might have been fine the way it was, but I did want to just show um, those options. So once again, I do recommend infinite color. It's a great way to add color grading. And if not, if you want even more control, filter, camera raw filter, and then go to your color grading section where you can do nice duotone effects, or you can also do a global. So if you were to do global, that would just add a color over the, the main photo, the general photo. In this case, I'm just going to hit cancel and go back to multiply. There we go. Okay. So I know we're past the hour. Any, um, Ali, any questions, comments, concerns, complaints? Um, not a question, but Mike Davis uh, says, excellent info and presentation style. Thank you. Um, you know, I've been, I've been tutoring for a while now, and I've done anything from one-on-one -on -one to small groups to large groups. And the one thing I've always felt really helps people is to explain each step as I go. So I don't, I try not to get too involved in like a theory or philosophy of it, but rather kind of break it down each step of the way. Um, any other questions? Well, how about one from me? Uh, you mentioned okay. that you, you were working with the sRGB color space. Uh, what monitor are you currently using right now? Right. So I'm a big fan of the BenQ. So if I go to system settings and I go to my displays, you'll see that I have the BenQ PD2725 view. And uh, it's quite, quite wonderful with color. It comes uh, certified calibrated. And, you know, in time, I may have to get the little calibration puck out. But so far, after using it for a couple months, it's still very solid and uh, nicely calibrated. Yep. Any, uh, I see there's some numbers in the Q and A in the chat, any other? Yeah, a lot of uh, thank yous. Uh, Laura says, thank you. Debbie says, great presentation. Uh, Herschel says, thank you. Rick says, uh, thanks, that's great. Great. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think Rick might have even posted, which I might reach out to him about the um, the link to that image verification that tells you if an image has been AI um, tampered with, I guess you could say, <laughs> um, or has AI elements. So uh, it's quite a nice tool. So, so uh, is there a way that I can get back into the view of us? Or should I stop sharing? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're still on the view. Okay. So is it, um, is, should I stop sharing? Is that the way to? <laughs> yeah, I, you could, yeah, you could stop sharing yeah. if, you, if you like, but uh, yeah, definitely. Um, great stuff, Andrew. Uh, what's the best way to get in contact with if you oh, have I follow up questions? Yeah, I should have not have stopped sharing because I have some, uh, it's, okay, so now you see Photoshop again, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, that's Zoom. So there we go. So I go to Window. First is if you want to follow some of my other uh, tutorials, as well as uh, different live events that I've hosted and presented, you can go to my Digital Art Drew. And let me find my navigator. My my panels are fighting with the Zoom panels. 
Okay. So yeah. So subscribe to my YouTube, just youtube.com slash digital art drew, or you could probably do a search for digital art drew. Um, as you can see here, I have Photoshop Lightroom focused, of course, the AI focused and digital art focused live events and tutorials. You can also find me on my Facebook page. And that is facebook.com slash digital artist drew. Currently, I have 12,000 followers, pretty active page, a great way to um, see the current digital artwork that I'm posting, as well as any live events I'm either presenting or hosting um, and uh, keeping you up to the news about Adobe and BenQ. And then if I go to window, um, can I give a little shout out to my groups, Ali? Yeah, of course. Yep. So a lot of you might already be in this group, my Photoshop and Lightroom group. It has uh, passed currently 351,000 members. So very active group on Facebook. Just simply uh, Photoshop and Lightroom group. You can do a search. And then when you see it pop up and, and it looks like it's the one with 351,000, just ask to join. And then I've started a, a new group that's growing pretty fast. And so that is the AI art and digital art group. And that's, that's the name. So just do a search for that. And that's a very creative group. A lot of AI art kind of sharing, you know, the AI art has really kind of boomed and blossomed. And so this group used to be like, I think it was just called like the digital, digital art group. And then the AI kind of took over. So I, balanced at AI art and digital art. So it's getting exciting and they are really implementing a lot more AI elements into Photoshop, Adobe Express, Illustrator. And uh, I think even maybe a little bit in Premiere now, I think you can extend like a video so you can add like the background to it just by kind of moving the crop type out. So, yeah. So, yep, yeah, that's different groups and where you can find me. So, And Andrew, will we see you again? And oh, we appreciate you presenting today. I, I hope so. <laughs> I'd love to have you back. This is, uh, I'm looking forward to the recording. I, I wanna pull up uh, Adobe uh, Photoshop beta on one monitor and play uh, the webinar recording on the other and follow along. Uh, today Absolutely. At the live session, I couldn't do it, but looking forward to tomorrow. Right, and just, just to clarify, because people always tend to ask, and uh, you can see my uh, Adobe Creative Cloud app now, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So if you go there, it looks like this. You click on apps. Like I said, you want to click updates, check for updates. That does a quick little check, little spiral. And then comes back, jumps back, tells you what's updated recently. On the left, under categories, you just go to beta apps. So once you go to beta apps, there's a list of all the different betas. And so Photoshop beta, mine says open because it's obviously installed since I worked with it today, but you just click on the install button and uh, it's a great, great app. And yes, one thing to be aware of, it's a beta. So there might be some crashes, there might be some bugs, um, but you do get a, extra features. So that's kind of the little balance that you you get by using the beta. So, great. All right, Andrew. Well, uh, thank you again for presenting. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we will send the recording out to everyone. So uh, thanks again, and everyone have a great night. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Andrew. Bye, everyone.